it's important to remember that attention is like a narrow mouth vessel. Pour into it what you have to say cautiously and, and as it were, drop by drop. So when we get asked how acupuncture works, this is kind of an interesting thing. And it's usually on the first visit, which is very tricky because all of a sudden they've come to our clinic space, uh, whether we're solo or we're working together with other practitioners. They've filled out the intake form. Uh, everything is so new. They sit down in the room. We do the initial intake. And then we ask them to lay down on a massage table. And all these different things are about to happen. They're about to get stainless steel placed under their skin. And the very first question I, I, I often get is, well, how does this stuff work? And I kind of warn them. One of, one of the biggest things I tell them, <clears throat> and I think it's important, is to prepare them for the answer because it's a can of worms question. And that's actually the language that I use. And I said, you've kind of asked the can of worms question. You, you, you want to go down the rabbit hole with me. And I also warn them that the language you want me to use is not the language I have because it's important for them to kind of get reframed. This is an absolutely amazing book. Alan Watts, The Way is End. And I just want to read you a little passage here, which kind of sums up the problem that we have when we're trying to communicate with our patients. There is then an analogy, and perhaps more than mere analogy, between central vision and conscious one-at-a-time thinking, and between peripheral vision and the rather mysterious process which enables us to regulate the incredible complexity of our bodies without thinking at all. It should be noted further that we call our bodies complex as a result of trying to understand them in terms of linear thought, of words and concepts. But the complexity is not so much in our bodies as in the task of trying to understand them by this means of thinking. We all go to Chinese medicine college. It takes us, some of us years, and even longer, to start to see the world in a Chinese medicine way. And we start using Chinese medicine language to diagnose our patients. The language they want us to use, and I tell them this, I said, hey, you went to, you had kind of a Western science upbringing. And because of that, you want me to tell you that it works on nerves. It's stimulating nerves. You want me to tell you that it's treating hormones. But I can't. I have to use the language that I have available. So I'm gonna start explaining to this, this to you. And I also wanna mention that even though patients really wanna understand what's going on, 40 to 80% of medical information provided by healthcare practitioners is forgotten immediately. And I've actually got the PubMed, there was a study done. And the other kind of concern that we have is we're in and out of the room. So we can look at that as, we're gonna come in and check at the five minute mark, we're gonna leave. So we don't have a lot of time, but we still have an opportunity to teach. So I talk often about translating Chinese medicine. I personally, professionally do not like using Chinese medicine terms in the clinic when I'm talking to patients. I do, when they say, hey, so what did you see on my tongue? What did my pulse tell you? I do not like telling them that they have liver cheese stagnation because the only thing they hear is liver and then they're holding their right side and they're going to their medical doctor in a week for a checkup and they're saying, oh my goodness, this Chinese medicine practitioner said there's something wrong with my liver. And I want to be, I want to go to work in a button up. I want to be regarded as a professional in the field and I'm very careful with the language. One of my patients is a emergency medical doctor and he told me that he met an osteopath who said that they were going to drain fluid from their head. And immediately he said, well, how are they going to do that? Are they going to aspirate? He said, no, it's going to, they're going to massage. They were massaging my feet to drain my head. We have to be very, very careful with the language that we use. Our language that we use in our medicine is for us and us alone. And I personally, professionally don't think it's for the general public unless they really want to get down 
the path and you will know over a course of eight to 10 treatments whether somebody really, really wants that information. So again, starting off telling them, listen, this is the can of worms question. And while I'm putting needles in, we can start with concepts patients understand. I tell them, I kind of joke, I, I put a little humor into it and I say, listen, everything I do for a living is metaphorical medicine. Everything I do for a living doesn't exist. The language that you want is you want me to tell you about viruses and bacteria and stuff that you can see in a microscope. And I'm going to talk about all these different concepts and they just don't exist. I also let them know that the ancients viewed us as a part of nature, not apart from nature. And I start to introduce Chinese medicine terms to them. And what I mean by this is a great example is I'll tell them, have you ever noticed that an ache or a pain gets worse when the dampness gets worse outside, when it's going to start raining? And, or do you know somebody that has maybe arthritis and their arthritis starts to flare up when it's, it's about to change? Because many people are barometers for weather pattern changes. And they'll say yes. And they say, well, that's Chinese medicine. And so I start kind of getting them to think about how they're affected by nature and starting to introduce Chinese medicine terms rather than tell them they've got kidney yin deficiency and the only thing they hear is kidney. 